ברוכים הבאים, ברוכות הבאות, welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the um, Israel Association of Writers in English. I'm Karen Elkali Gut. We've been meeting together on Zoom for the past two years, and we're discovering that, that this is not just, not just a, a situation being closed in, because we have been closed in. We haven't been able to have open events uh, in live events, but, but this is a situation where we get to meet people all over the world and stay staying safe at the same time uh, in our own little living rooms. And that's allowed us to transcend a lot of, uh, a lot of the limitations that we've been living with. Today, I'm gonna jump right into it. Today, we have two fascinating writers who happen to be connected to each other. Daughter, Maddie Khan, and mother, Nessa Rappaport. Maddie Khan is a writer and editor whose work has been published in Vogue, Elle, Glamour, Vox, and Buzzfeed, among other publications. Her first book, Young and Restless, is coming. It's forthcoming from Viking. That means your mother must be reading the uh, proofs now, right? <laughs> and Nessa Rappaport's most recent book is the fascinating book, Evening, a novel that's now in paperback and has been acclaimed as a 220 best book of the fall by Vogue, Lit Hub, Start, Publishers Weeking, Weekly, among other things, other places. Uh, she's the author of three previous books. And that's all they allowed me to say about them at this moment, because there's so much more. And I'm glad I didn't write the introduction because I would feel like a mosquito in a nudist colony. I, I, I just wouldn't know where, where to begin. <laughs> They're just so prolific and so uh, profound. So, Maddie, Nessa, take it away. Unmute yourselves. I think I am unmuted, Maddie. I'm unmuted, mm -hmm. here I am. Well, one of our motivations for having you read, and thank you, Karen, for having us, and thank you all members of my family and anyone who writes in English for being here and giving us the gift of your time. Um, our one of my motivations for having you read the bios is because being a complete maniacal, gentle fanatic about every syllable of my work, it happens that there were inadvertent errors on the bios of the lovely, uh, announcement that you sent out. So of course, being an editor as well as a writer, I simply had to correct it. So thank you for allowing me to indulge my mania. It's very modest mania. <laughs> Maddie and I, uh, I, let me just say, I had no intention ever of imagining that I would have a daughter who was a writer or indeed imagining anything of the way my children would turn out to be. And Maddie, I think you were a little surprised to turn out to be a writer as well, weren't you? Wait, Maddie's not on camera. Uh, this... Maddie? Hmm. Let's find Maddie out. Maddie disappeared. Um... Let's find out what happened. While Just keep I... going. She'll come back. Okay. Off. Keep going. Okay. Um, improvise. <laughs> don't worry. Go off <laughs> script. Whole, Go off script life, and improvise. My whole life is an improvisation. So actually, it's very convenient because now I thought to myself, since most of you haven't read Evening, I thought maybe in order to understand what, what I had done and why, in truth, it took me 30 years to do a book I thought would be a breeze one of my fastest, turned out to be decades long. I wanted to read a little bit from the beginning just to give you a taste. Um, Evening is about two sisters in their 30s, one grieving the other. And the one who is grieving has come back from New York where she lives to Toronto where she was born and where her sister was Canada's most acclaimed uh, TV journalist. 
this book, to, to, to subvert Ricky's future question, this book is not autobiographical, unlike some of my work, but it does have tendrils and um, tidbits from real life that I did not expect to find in it and that I didn't plan. The setup, thank goodness, is not real because I have, I'm blessed with three sisters and they're all in the world. This is the beginning of chapter one. And the reason that I'm reading from the beginning is because the book I knew from the start would have one very big secret that she knows the narrator discovers very quickly in the book, but it turned out that there were many other secrets that I didn't know either. And that's probably one of the reasons it took me so long, not only to find out what these secrets were, but then to find good ways to unravel the secrets skillfully so that my readers would pay attention, but not guess too soon. But if they did guess, it wouldn't matter, et cetera. So here is the beginning of evening very briefly. One loves, the other is loved. So Nana taught us. I look at the beautiful bones of her face and speculate about this pronouncement. My grandmother has always been beloved. And so my grandfather, long dead, assumes a peculiar poignancy. Once in some rapturous, unimaginable youth before she married, Nana was the ardent lover. But no one is alive to tell us about the object of her affection and she will not disclose his name. We are sitting in the living room of my mother's house, waiting for the funeral to begin. Outside, the sky is the eerie pewter I remember from my childhood, lightless even at midday. In this room, six years ago, before our mother recovered the furniture yet again, Tam and I were laughing at the weather. Then, too, it was noon when I realized, after her baby's ceremony was over, and the last guests had straggled out that the day would not improve, that to quote Tam, this is it. I had fled to New York, whose winters are tamed by the city's determination to outwit the season. Tam not only stayed in Toronto, betraying our pack to leave the minute we could, but chose a profession that forced her to rise most mornings at four in order to be on the air. For her, the half year of darkness is permanent, I think to myself, and then think permanent darkness. Paralyzed, I stare at Nana, imploring her to rescue me, but she is stoic, not emitting whatever feelings she no doubt has. The fact is my sister, her eldest grandchild is dead. The silence in this room is not the anticipatory hush preceding a family celebration, but the void of what cannot be accommodated. Tam, in speaking my sister's name, I have invaded Nana's solitude. I look at her carefully and observe, even in the somber room, that the skin beneath her eyes is gleaming. No one has seen my grandmother cry. Lawrence is coming, I state, more bluntly than intended. Nana's lips draw into a pucker of distaste. Once again, Eve has said the wrong thing. Why doesn't my adm admiration of my grandmother offset her reservations about me? So that's a taste of evening. I stopped first of all, because I don't believe in long readings on short meetings. And second of all, because she's about to go into a sexual reverie. And even though I wrote the passage, I could never read it out loud to anyone, including all of you. I, I can read it for you if you want. I know. I, I often get a volunteer. I think you can read it to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Has Maddie come back on? I'm here. Great. Okay. Maddie? Have a couple internet couples, but we're making it work. Okay. I was oh, an internet couple. Yes. I hadn't thought of that bandwidth problem. Um, Maddie, I was saying earlier that I think you found yourself a little surprised to be a writer, that it wasn't your intention. Could you tell us a little about that? Yeah, I wanted to go be a consultant, work in business. Uh, I wanted to do something else that wasn't as hard as writing. Um, 
And yeah, I still can't say exactly how it happened that I ended up here. Um, I, I, Martin, I guess- really Martin, Martin, yes. just, let me interrupt yes. you just for a second, one minute. Technical. I just want to let everybody know if you want to see just Matty speaking without in a big box and not a little box, you go to the top right to view and you click on speaker and then you can see her in all her glory. Oh my. There oh, you go. It's... Keep going. Yes. So I actually think the first job that I actually really wanted is I thought I would work in fashion. Um, so I worked at Fashion Week in New York, and it was very exciting. Um, and uh, then I got a little tired of that. And then I thought I might work in politics. So I worked on a book about the election. Um, and I found all those people to be tiring too. So then I thought, you know what, the life of a solitary writer is, is the life for me. Um, and I ended up writing more. Um, I started writing for Elle, among other publications in college, and I went to work at Elle after I graduated. Um, for those who don't know, it's a women's magazine, kind of similar to Vogue. Uh, and I have been writing ever since, not meaning to follow in my mother's footsteps, but here we are. And I would say the good thing about being uh, the writer who is the daughter of a writer is that when you're up late at night trying to think of the right adjective for a piece that you're on deadline for, there's someone else in the world who you can call who cares as much as you do about how this adjective sounds coming after that adjective. And uh, I think most writers don't have that experience. So I count myself lucky. Yes, one of the great experiences of recent years, Maddie knows, and some of you may have seen this document. Let me find it. Uh, I have here a 32 page single space double columned document that has in it literally every single word in the evening that I checked and rechecked over the last few years I was writing the book to make sure that no distinctive word appeared either too often or more than once. I have a wonderful friend writer named Daphne Merkin who coined the aphorism, you can have only one cerulean in a book. That is very true. There are no ceruleans in this book, but I do have a cerulean in the memoir I wrote, House on the River, and you can be sure I made certain that there wouldn't be another one because I find, even though I read so passionately, I don't notice this in other writers, I mind. And this document, I'll give you an example, implying impossible, impressed, improvised, impulsively, inadvertently, inanely, inaugural. You get the idea. I counted how many, I decided what spacing I could live with. And then I'd like Maddie to say her version of this. Some people are really, really happy when their kids go out and make a lot of money on the stock market, but this is what made me happy. Go for it, Maddie. I finished my book in end of September, um, and when I handed it in, I too had, I did it in a spreadsheet, Mom, so a little bit more technologically savvy, but uh, I had a spreadsheet with phrases I couldn't deal with uh, repeating, um, and I would say I agree that I don't notice in other people's work too many repetitive words, but I absolutely do notice writers who use the words, of course, more than once in an article, maybe twice if we're talking New Yorker length feature. Um, so we're hard on our, we're definitely harder on ourselves, but we're hard on other people too. Um, and I too had a list and I made sure to check it to make sure that I didn't have too many repeated adjectives or phrases. And I like to thank to my editor, you're welcome, because I did some of her work for her. Right, and I discovered, I don't know if my sister Tova is on this uh, meeting, but she is a teacher of linguistics, a professor of linguistics in, at, um, at Ben Gurion. And I have discovered a kind of verbal tick that, it, that to which many writers in English are vulnerable. And I wanted to know what the name of this was. And I, I found it very hard to put into English, but I did. And she told me the name of it in linguistics, which is collocation. And it's an instance where two words are put together and they don't sound like a cliche because they're not a phrase, but they are a kind of lazy way of writing. And I got very anxious and I still do when I start to notice these kinds of words. I'll give you two examples in my work. This is what they sound like, profound regret, or he will be deeply missed. 
you know the next word that's going to come when you say the first word. And it's so easy to fall into those verbal habits. But that's yet another reason why writing takes me a very long time. I do want to say that it doesn't have to take a long time. Uh, my daughter uh, is a very expeditious writer. She does not procrastinate more than an hour or two. I like to say of myself, from the thought to the deed can take a thousand years and I don't have a thousand years. So uh, that's what Maddie and I share in our own different modalities. The other thing that I wanna say as the mother of a daughter who's a writer is, and here I wanna pay tribute to my mother-in-law, Aleha HaShalom Ellen Khan, whose daughter Felice is on this call because she was the paradigmatic person who followed her children and grandchildren to wherever they landed and whoever they turned out to be. So I live to read, I always have, I always will. I used to joke that my importuning children would be crying when they were small and I had to finish the New York Times or it was a competition and often the Times won. But I tried hard not to have expectations in advance of what I quote wanted from my children. So to have turned out to have a daughter, not only who's a writer I so admire and whose work I find utterly compelling and I think utterly compelling might be a collocation, so forgive me, but um, she's a reader and she loves, we share the same taste very, very often, even though she's a different generation quite a bit and I learned so much from her by her being a different generation. But I think all of you can imagine there's no greater pleasure than, than loving a book and giving it to someone and finding out that he, she, they feel exactly the same way. And that has happened to Maddie and me many times. And the books we dislike that the general culture likes, we also share. Maddie, do you wanna say a word about this, not naming any names? I wouldn't dream. Um, yeah, that's often find the same things overrated. What a pleasure that is. Um, and uh, it's, I mean, without naming names, it's a little hard to explain, but yeah, I would say that, uh, that anytime I want to roll my eyes at something, I can be sure that you are rolling your eyes probably at the exact same thing, which is yes, a joy. It's very gratifying. When Karen and I were in correspondence, she said that people may want to know, how do you find an audience? I want to say right away, I have no idea how you find an audience. And if there are methods, I know I'm not following them. But I do want to say, people should not underestimate the virtue of feeling superior. And it feels really good if you dislike a book that the whole culture likes. It does not make me think, oh, I'm living in such a Philistine culture. It makes me think, for me. That's right. So mother, you can address now. Uh, you were at different stages of the big projects that we have been working on. So I'm in the middle of revising my book, which will be out next year, hopefully in the spring. Um, but you are in the position that probably anyone who considers themselves a writer has been in before, which is you just finished the big thing. And now you have a new blank sheet of paper in front of you. So why don't you talk a little bit about what it's like to start something new when you don't know exactly what shape it will take? Because I'm at the good part. I'm at the part where I just get to follow my own agenda and do right what's in front of me. Well, this will be a short conversation because Maddie knows that I have not begun anything new. And day after day goes by, I can't believe it. I intend to write, I intend to try, I intend to follow my own advice, which is write badly, write every day, write for just 20 minutes, write three times a week, start your day by writing, it doesn't matter what you write. I was an editor in a publishing company for 12 years at Bantam Books, and I know how to help other people get off their square and write. But I do not, as Maddie knows, follow my own advice. First, I was frustrated. Then I was bewildered. Now, unfortunately, I feel totally fine. I know it's coming. I have my little tendrils. I have little bits in a file. But I can't quite, I can't coalesce the narrative. I can't figure out who the characters are. And I tell myself I'm just not ready. I used to have this joke, which some of you who've heard me speak before could say that if I take as long to write the next book as I did to write this book, 
only my creator, hoping I do meet my creator, will be the reader, my sole reader by the time it's done. So I'm hopeful. I have a wonderful friend, Juan, who did something I've never done because no one had read my entire book over those 30 years. I'm not part of writers groups and I haven't shared my work. I just cloistered myself day after day with my day job, my incredible children and all the other responsibilities we have and either wrote or didn't write until I finished. But Tom said, Nessa, in 1922, in sorry, in 2022, let's have a weekly meeting and exchange how far we've gotten in our new novels. Well, so far we've had two meetings, no, three. First one I canceled. Did I keep the second one? Maybe. He has been embarking and I have said to him, I'm just going to keep doing this until I'm so ashamed that I have to start. So that's my update on my current book. Your accountability practice. I think that's very admirable. Thank you. Um, Maddie, I'm not going to ask you about your strategies to avoid writing because I know they're about five minutes long. Um, I do want to say that I had the other great gift of watching Maddie as an 11 year old read in one or two sittings my memoir of a houseboat trip I took with my mother, my uncle and aunt and my uh, Josh, Maddie's elder brother, who was nine and Maddie, who was five, and I was pregnant with my third uh, to return to the summer landscapes of our childhood. And there was something exceptional about watching Maddie at that age read through the book that was the story of her trip, albeit when she was five. So I do, I think Maddie and I know each other really well. We have traveled together and spent entire weeks at a time only talking. She she got me to uh, do one of her gigs, which was to take the newly renovated Queen Mary from London to New York. And literally there was nothing to do on the boat for, how long was it, Maddie? Seven days? Eight days. Eight days, uh, except stare out the window, which looked exactly the same because it turned out that there were no landscapes. There was just sky and water looking exactly the same every day. But we still managed to talk morning, noon, and night. Yes. Oh, yeah. that was Maddie, how did we do that? Um, that's <laughs> I will say that I got invited to go on this trip and I had to ask myself, do I know any person in the world, including my then boyfriend, now fiance, who would want to fly to London in order to the very next day, get on a boat to sail back to New York. And I could come up with only one person. You were the only person I knew who would ever want to do that. Um, and I, I mean, I think for my writing, for the most part, I get most of my ideas for things that I want to write because I'm out in the world and talking to people and I write, I think more, I write more profiles and those kinds of things than you do, but where do your ideas for your writing, where does that come from? Well, I was profiled when I, when Evening first came out by the wonderful David Green and Haaretz and the tagline that they've used that turns up all the time was a sentence I said, I am the Jewiest writer who ever lived. And I would say that I have such a sense of calling about being a writer and being a Jew. I, I'm in love with language. It suits me very well that we're the people of the book. I was gifted with a Jewish education by my parents, and I understand only as an adult what a gift that was, which gave me access to Hebrew and to sacred text, not unfortunately with to Yiddish, as Karen and I have briefly exchanged notes about. I wish that I had, but I didn't understand what a gap that would be in my life as a Jewish writer. Uh, I have always been fascinated by the imprint of Jewishness on English, both in language and in stories that were never told before. I, my first novel uh, had chapters, chapter one, chapter Olive, chapter two, chapter Beit. I insisted to my publisher, my mainstream publisher, William Morrow, that I would not put any Hebrew words in italics, nor would I directly translate them. I wanted to show the organic way in which Hebrew and English were part of my being and part of my narrative. And in different ways, the Jewishness and even Hebrew, certainly sacred texts never translated or alluded to directly are always appearing in my work. The other thing I would say is, as Maddie knows, 
um, I, this is an easy statement to make for this crowd. Um, I am a mystic and Maddie is a lit box. So that is one way in which we are really, really different. So I feel at every second that the world is a war between light and dark and every single thing we do either brings forth more light or adds darkness. Uh, Maddie comes at her identity as a writer and a Jew in a very different way. Maddie, I'll let you talk about yourself. Um, well, see, the thing, the problem with being like me versus being like you is I don't even have anything to say to that. I would just say, well, I, I just don't ever look at things that way. Um, I would say that, uh, right, anytime that you're talking about spirituality or as you famously once said that when you're not talking you're thinking about god that is not something that um, has happened to me but um i also actually i think surprisingly have written more about jewish topics than i might have expected when i first started writing um i wrote about i've written about it for buzzfeed i've written about the show off for vox and now i have a story coming out in the atlantic that's about that um, and it does come up, it does come up more than I would have thought when I started writing. Of course, when I first started writing, I was writing mostly about fashion. So there was less, there was less intersection there. Um, but yes, we are different in that regard. I will never publish a book of poetry. I think that's really safe to say. Uh, nor do I expect to um, publish any uh, very allegorical texts. But uh, I am happy to you mean, read. You mean with biblical sources inlaid with within those stories? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, I don't. And I will ever do that. Um, but luckily, there's there's room for both of us in this town. So we can be nicely complimentary. Yes. And I do think that I'm always struck by Maddie's intrepid way of bringing issues such as the Shoah, Jewish identity, anti-Semitism, never as an essay about those things, sometimes actually about the Shoah, but very particular people because um, Felice and my husband are uh, children of refugees and survivors of great tragedy. And that has been a subject that's inevitably going to be part of my children and probably their children's direct inheritance. I think it's impossible to be Jewish without feeling that in some way. I wanna say a word about stories and Israel. I love Israel with all my heart and Maddie loves Israel as well in her own way. And I have been so struck by the incongruity of the fact that Israelis measure very, very high on the happiness scale. But in terms of stories of trauma, which I do believe can be epigenetic and certainly have inflected my day-to-day -day life and how I look at myself and carry the burden of the sorrows of my past as a Jew and as a family, almost every Israeli has either expulsion, exile, or the Shoah, and sometimes all of them in, in is her their background. So I'm really intrigued by Israelis' ability to metabolize that trauma uh, sometimes with great cost, I know. I do read Haaretz and A Times of Israel. I refresh them about five times a day. Um, I'm very obsessed with the narrative of the state of Israel. But as writers there, all of you, it's fascinating to see the way in which Israeli society turns that degree of trauma in I would say virtually anyone, certainly my age, uh, but often a couple of generations later, uh, also the global nature of Israeli Jewry, which is very different from American Jewry. Uh, the fact that everywhere there are these musics and cultures and languages from which people descend. And sometimes people who are native Israeli have little phrases or Zmirot or Piyutim or something from the background. That kind of richness to me is very, very suggestive of great literature. Well, Mom, as someone who's been published both in the States and in Israel and who's given many talks to both American audiences and Israeli audiences, do you think you're read differently in the two countries? Well, people who don't read English easily of whom there are many very fluent in Hebrew Israelis I know. I remember my cousin Ricky, who's right there, saying 
that Israelis may be very, very diverse, but everybody lives in their own bubble in some ways. Um, so I don't know how I'm, quote, read. I do think that American Jewry, I think the most important activity we can engage in globally now, apart from the obvious fighting anti-Semitism, Jewish education, is to build a bridge of culture between Israel and American Jews, between Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs for that matter, and American Jews. I think it's something that would be profound and also useful to the Jewish people to start to ask the question you just asked, Maddie. I think it's very different to be an Israeli. And there's no such thing as an Israeli. Israelis come from all kinds of stories, backgrounds, cities, towns, kibbutzim, moshavim, et cetera. But I don't think we know each other intimately if we ever did. And I think there's Every time I'm in the room with someone who's Israeli and we can start to talk, I'm so intrigued. One must be curious. And to keep growing, you have to be curious. And we need to get much, much more curious about each other. Yeah. Maddie, why don't you tell everybody what you did with your gap year in Israel compared to what most people in our social sphere do? I... Much of my graduating class went to Israel for the year after I graduated high school. Um, and instead of going to study in a seminary, which I didn't particularly want to do, I went to culinary school, which was great. Loved it. Ate very well and fed many friends uh, in that time. Um, and, and it was- now during COVID, you're cooking constantly. Yes, uh, especially in the beginning um, before takeout was once again, uh, once again became a viable possibility. Um, but it was- and I like to say that when I started college, I was the only uh, freshman um, attending who already had a degree since I had gotten, obviously, my degree from culinary school. Uh, so that was a wonderful way to spend a year. Um, and I think to make a slight connection to our the topic at hand, it was probably the only year, I think really the only year I've had where I didn't really feel the pull of either work or school. And as someone who took school very seriously, um, I worked really, really hard. Uh, and it was it was one of the few opportunities to just be a reader, not a writer or a generator or a worker or a student um, in the conventional sense. And I would say, if you ever feel stuck working on something, making a very elaborate dish in the kitchen will really get your mind off of um, the grammatical structure of a pair working. So I recommend that very highly as a one of our many avoidant writing strategies. That's a good one. Well, Maddie, Maddie knows that I hoped my adult children would be able to do three things that I could not do. Read a blot of Gemara and actually make my way through it, even though I have studied Gemara, but I'm not that adept. Drive, which I don't do to my great regret, and cook, which I do only through brunch. Or as Josh, Maddie's brother, famously said, um, dad's the cook and mom's the feeder. I can get them from empty to full, but it wouldn't be from cooking. So that's another reason I really admire my daughter. Karen, I know you have some questions. I just want to end my own talk with one comment about Israel. I read many, many. I'm fascinated by the birth of Israel. I'm fascinated by early Zionism. I'm fascinated by the flaws of Israel, which I have a lot of tenderness for since all countries have terrible flaws. Uh, I am fascinated by the early Hebrew writers and their ability, even if they knew Hebrew in Galut, their ability to move to Israel, Palestine, Israel, and start to write in a different language and create a body of work that was classic, not just nascent uh, and become the writers that are the writers we look back on as giving birth to contemporary modernism in Hebrew. I did live in Israel for two years in my 20s and I don't know how conscious I was of it but I think one of the reasons I didn't stay was because I never felt that I could make that transition. I think if you're forced to make it, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, we had a lot of choices in the America of then which did not, which seemed to be the most golden of all times to be a diaspora Jew, and which also had components that really mattered to me, like Jewish feminism, 
and the Havara movement and Jewish creativity of a kind, religious creativity that hadn't yet happened in Israel. But the chief reason was Hebrew. My, I can make myself understood. I can listen to Hebrew. My Hebrew reading is still painstakingly slow. And of which I'm embarrassed as a Jew because so few people have been bequeathed access to Hebrew in North America, at least. I think other countries are a little better. But to foreclose asking me why I don't live there as a Jewish writer because of the density of Jewishness in the state of Israel, I do want to say English, Christian as its roots are, English is my mother tongue. And it would be hard, it was hard for me to imagine making that transition. Now, your group didn't exist, and I hadn't considered too much being an expatriate English writer, but I thought it might be hard to feel it, there wasn't a global world the way there is now where English is more accessible and you can go online and print things uh, and let people read the way that wonderful site, which I'm sure you know, jewishfiction.net, that's based in Canada, but publishes Jewish fiction from all over, including Israel and in translation from countries with far fewer Jews. So that's that's in addition to my love of Israel and my protectiveness about Israel for all its really difficult uh, situations and mistakes. Um, I did want to say that one word about being a Jewish writer and Hebrew and English. So Karen, open to you. You're on mute, as we like to say in 2022. Karen, you're on mute. I'm on mute because I can't, you've, you've gone through so many of my questions with the question. I think that most of the writers here uh, who live in Israel and uh, haven't managed to find an audience outside. Some of us have, some of us have, uh, you know, have people that we talk to, uh, have, have an audience, we, we publish, we, you know, we communicate, but many of us have a problem not, you know, not with uh, just writing to some publisher, but to, you know, making our uh, situation unique. Uh, the situation here is so complicated that um, I keep getting questions like, you know, uh, do you know any Arabs? Do you always see Arabs as enemies? Do you, uh, you know, uh, there are questions that are so unlike what we experience in our daily lives. All right, Karen, are those questions you just got in the chat? And those, that's a question, uh, that's a question I got from people before. Oh. They wanted to know about how we can open this dialogue and how we can have a dialogue with people who, uh, who see us as riding camels. Uh, uh, I can't, I, I, I don't know anyone in that world. I can't answer that question. I can say that I participated as a much younger Jewish writer in a wonderful conference that was held by the then National Foundation for Jewish Culture that doesn't exist anymore between Israeli writers, including Anton Shamas, not just Jewish writers, and American Jewish writers that was extremely fruitful for me and really allowed me to hear directly from Israeli writers at that time. This was 1988, a long time ago. And that the couple of Kisufim conferences that took place, I was I participated maybe in the first Kisufim conference through my friend Michal Govrin, an Israeli writer. Yeah. Um, uh, they, those conferences are very, very important. And I don't know whether those kinds of communions are still happening. Uh, I know that I'm part of a community of the Sammy Rohr Prize that every other year brings together the judges of the Fiction Award, the judges of the Nonfiction Award, and the winners, and I, there's another word for the, I think it's given out to three, so there are other two, uh, and it's obviously a pool that keeps increasing, and some of them include Israeli writers, um, and also the Agent Deborah Harris, who's a wonderful friend of mine, and she, Deborah, brings the news, as do the Israeli writers, of what it's like to be Israeli, to be a writer, whether in Hebrew and in English. And we need a lot more of those encounters. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope this is the beginning. I hope that we can uh, add many more. There are many other questions. 
by other people. I, I would love to spend the whole the whole thing, the whole hour with you, but I guess we'll have lunch in New York or Tel Aviv in, in a short time. So why not um, open it up? I know that Michael has a question and uh, a, a few other people have told me they really want to, to ask you things. So uh, um, a question for Mati. Um, listening to your mother speaking um, about herself and her writing, it, it's so clear that she is a Jewish writer. Um, I haven't read your work, but even Eve, you know, your character that you read at the beginning, Eve and Evening, and it's all, it's, it's Jewish. Do you consider yourself um, a Jewish writer or a writer who is Jewish, as, as contrasting to your mother? Interesting question. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, I feel like it, it, I base it a little bit on what I'm working on in a given moment. And because most of my work has not been particularly connected to Jewish topics, I think of myself mostly as a writer who is Jewish. But I will say that, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this idea of building an audience or, you know, my mother appears nowhere on social media. That's her preference. She doesn't want to have any social media presence whatsoever. Um, I'm not that way. I am all over social media. And so my work has mostly not been about Jewish topics, but anyone who follows me on any platform, probably one of the first things that they know about me is that I'm Jewish because that's a fixation of my conversation online in terms of commenting about what's going on in the news or merely taking in whatever cultural product is, uh, you know, latest consumable in America. Uh, right, so I but, would say but do you use your writing skills to tackle your Jewish identity? Uh, you know, being Jewish, not, that's fine, but how do not, you grapple and do, you know, chevruta with yourself, um, yeah. in a Talmudic, you know, pilpul with yourself to, to figure it out who who you are. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's the work of a lifetime and it's definitely something that my mother does in a more forthright way than I do. I don't think writing is the medium through which I have done that work so far in my career. Um, but I'm also in, at a point in my professional life where for the first time I'm controlling all the stories that I'm writing. So for the past, you know, 10 years, basically, I've been on staff at magazines. And when you are a staff writer at a place like Elle or Glamour, your job is not to do pill pool with yourself. Your job is to do the assignments well that you are assigned and to tell stories in ways that are interesting to your readership. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, let's talk in two years after I've been investigating more for myself, what's interesting to me and what I most want to write about. Um, but yes, the job of a staff writer is to serve the audience. Uh, and so any, any, self-exploration that you can do uh, sort of incognito while you're also doing the job that you're paid for is kind of a bonus. Um, but I'm, I'm as interested as, you know, as anyone else to see what really holds my interest and what I, I choose to do now that I am more unfettered uh, in terms of what I can write about and what I can tackle. So, so we have a date. Thought? We have a date. Two years. Two we'll, years. I'll ask the question again. Let's reconvene. Right. Hope I have a good I'm answer. I would like to enhance uh, from my perspective, um, both the question and the answer. I think the question is very oh, good. Not. I'm so bossy, is that what yeah. you said? Yes. Um, it's very Jewish and very Israeli to ask that question both, but Maddie has heard me say this. I think when you're in love with the Jewish story, as I am, it's very, very easy to speak to other people in your work who are also in love with the Jewish story, not that evening, I mean, evening surpassed beyond my expectations who read it. And I owe a considerable amount of that audience to Maddie, who lovingly talked about it on her various platforms, which she knew that I didn't and couldn't do. But I do, I'm struck by the fact that when people in America who are Jewish fall in love with Jewish literacy and fall in love with telling the Jewish story, they often choose Jewish professions. They become Jewish educators or a new generation of rabbis or work in Jewish cultural institutions. What I'm really interested in, and I see Maddie as an exemplar of it, is what happens if you 
were given a profound Jewish education, you have a forthright and very strong sense of yourself as a Jew, and you're deeply, deeply in the world. You are part of the New York situation, you're part of American media, you have friends of all kinds in all kinds of walks of media life. To me, there's a, I'll use Hebrew, because I can, shat, remez, drash, and sod aspect to the way in which we manifest our Jewishness. And it is not nearly the case that the only way to do it is to address those questions, Michael, in a more shot way. And I would argue that if you're on Twitter talking about the Shoah and talking about anti-Semitism and being really courageous, no matter who's out there, just calling it like it is, you're saying something important about yourself. And this is one of the things Maddie's heard me say that she never discusses this, but I admire Maddie so much because she's put to the test. I'm not on social media. I'm not put to that test. And what, but you would be great at social media, Mom. Yeah. I'm, what, Maddie? That you would be amazing at social media, which I'm constantly on. You're, you're breaking up, honey. <laughs> and it's probably good. I was congrats. I was saying how good you would be at social media. Yes, Maddie, Maddie is my best cheerleader. And as some of you know, Maddie got me involved in a what's meant to be, I think, monthly at least, but hasn't yet been a newsletter called Things I Ask My Mother, which is a conversation about various topics like the conversation we're having now, except that it was about ambition and gratitude and other things we're going to talk about. I think planning is going to be the next one. And I so enjoy that conversation. That's so wonderful. Uh, Michael Loftus has a question that he would like to ask. Me. Can you hear me? Am I yeah. there? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, I'm in the snow, and on that is the basis of my question. Um, when you read uh, uh, Tanessa, and I apologize if we may in fact know each other, but I have a funny feeling we don't. But your uh, setting is Toronto. Right. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, setting your novel in Toronto. Well, Maddie has Maddie interviewed me at my invitation for the launch of the evening for the the online party we had. And either then or at another conversation, she asked me a question I had never thought of, which is she knows I quote made Aliyah to New York City as soon as I could. Could. I wanted, the minute I met the Upper West Side, I knew that's where I belonged. And people say there are New Yorkers born everywhere. And I was really one of those people. I couldn't wait to leave the Toronto of my childhood, which there's no resemblance at all to the Toronto, the sophisticated, diverse Toronto of now. But I had never considered that my work, my first novel is set mostly in Toronto, a little bit of New York and a little bit of Israel. Um, my Poems, A Woman's Book of Grieving, has Canada as its background. House on the River, the houseboat trip to the summer landscapes of my childhood is obviously set in Ontario. And Evening is set in Toronto too, where I haven't lived since 1974. So why? I think I am very nourished by both the sorrows and the gleaming joys of the past. I am fascinated by the past. Uh, it has a distilled perfume to me. Maddie and I share that. Uh, we love all kinds of writers from the past. Uh, my heroine is obsessed with British women novelists between the wars. Uh, so am I by complete coincidence. So was my actual grandmother for whom Maddie's named. Um, uh, and I think Maddie also somehow imbibed this interest in British fiction and British moors. So Canada, which was then much more British than it is now, when I was, until 1967, Canada's flag was the Union Jack, and we sang God Save the Queen, and we didn't have our own yet identity as a Commonwealth country, but not really much more part of England. And mostly what I read as a child were British novels, the same as my mother and my grandmother read from a Little Princess and The Secret Garden and Anne of Green Gables and many, many others that made me sob my heart out after I read them again and again and again. So I feel even though I left home as many writers do and I did not, I was pretty sure that I would not be returning to Canada. 
somehow the nourishment, the roots, the emotion starts there. And that's the only explanation I have. Um, just, uh, I'm sorry, this is a Toronto question. Uh, cause I was also there in 1974. Uh, what school did you go to? <laughs> Went to Associated. Ah, there we go. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Talk to me after this meeting. <laughs> Let's move I on. went to Associated for two weeks. They kicked me out. Oh, those are my favorite <laughs> kinds of people. <laughs> I'm sure we get along splendidly. <laughs> Uh, I think that's part of part of uh, Israeli culture is that we say right away to someone we say we say you know who where where are you from no where are you really from <laughs> you know, where are your parents from where are your grandparents from uh, we we always oh, want to know the sources because we know that no one is really from here. Or few yes, we we have a version of that too because if you're part of any sort of observant Jewish life as I am and as Toby, my husband is, you've gone to certain schools and summer camps, you've spent a lot of time in Israel. Both of us have sisters in Israel and many, many cousins who made Aliyah. Mm -hmm. So when I would go to visit our children on visitor's day, I didn't know most of the parents because I didn't grow up with them. Toby, who's also an extrovert, which helps, knew everybody, everybody. But Maddie, why don't you say what Jason, Maddie's fiance used to say to her years ago when they were newer in their relationship about walking down the streets of the West Side. Well, in true outside fashion, there's incredible construction happening outside my window right now. So if you hear buzzing in the background, those are the people on the roof across the street from me doing honestly, who knows what, but, um, it's true that when I was born, I mean, I grew up on 76th Street in Amsterdam. I now live on 88th and West End. So I moved a whopping 12 blocks north. I used to live on 85th, so that was even closer. Um, and suffice it to say that when you walk through this neighborhood, you end up seeing a lot of people that you know from one context or another. Uh, and it is true that when we first started dating, Jason was very surprised to find that the conspiracy theory was true and that actually all Jews in this neighborhood really did know each other um, and all had people in common and could all find ways to get in touch with each other at all times. So unfortunately, that element of the grand conspiracy is accurate. Yes, we always say don't tell, but we're among friends here, even if this does end up, end up getting posted. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to ask a question. I'm so enjoying this, I could, Matthew, I can't tell you, uh, because maybe it, it, it links into what we've been talking about. Do you find in your writing that you have to self-censor? Be uh, because I'm sensitive to that in what you write, but that's because we're cousins. But do you try to self-censor? Does it stop you at some point? Um, it applies to both of you. I think it applies to all writers. Maddie, do you want to take that first? <laughs> well, I'm just, I have to laugh because I think, you know, does she censor herself? I don't know. Does she censor her child? Yes, actually she does. <laughs> so yes, the, the, the cautionary tale is that if you're going to mail, uh, mail your mother a draft of your work that contains any personal family information at all, be prepared for her to say she thinks you should take it out, uh, even though she does that in her work relentlessly all the time. So uh, our standards for ourselves are different from our standards from other people. Um, but I, I think on a on a serious level, there's always, uh, you know, writing for in public is not the same as writing in your diary. So the things that you would say or feel, there's always an editorial process that goes through them, uh, that, or rather that they have to go through. And that's true even of the most confessional writers who it seems as though they put everything out there. They too are editing, even if they're not editing for precisely the same things that you know you or I would. So I think self-censorship happens. Um, and sometimes the thing that serves the work best is at odds with the things that you personally would like not to share. And then it just always becomes, for me at least, kind of a cost-benefit analysis. Like how much better does this disclosure make the 
piece that I'm working on and sometimes it feels worth it and sometimes it doesn't but I would be very interested to hear my mother's thoughts on this and she's so much more confessional than I am but also so much more scrupulous about my own writing (laughs) (laughs) well when I was young I didn't think about it when I wrote preparing for sabbath which was artful and which did render materials from my life into fiction Uh, but which many people took to be entirely autobiographical, like many first novels, uh, and which when questioned, my father, when when people would say to my father, but I don't understand, is it fiction or is it a memoir? He would say it's science fiction, which I thought was a very good answer. (laughs) But I felt entitled to my story. I felt, as as, I quote Maddie, as this is the thing I quote most from Maddie, oh mom, you and your morose childhood. (laughs) <laughs> As a child who suffered, and I did, very much from being very porous and from other things, uh, growing up in the 50s was a very hard time to be a smart girl, and I don't recommend it. I mean, growing up in war or growing up as a refugee in La Hachevot, but it was not easy to get the messages that saturated the world I lived in about ambition and what women's role could be and being the eldest of four daughters and no sons who literally heard people come up and say to me, does your father feel bad that he doesn't have a son? I would like to quote my sister Tova again, the brother we don't have is the luckiest boy who never was born. Very (laughs) true. (laughs) Not good to be the only boy in a group of sisters in the 50s, a lot of pressure. So at that time, I believe my mother, who is a very snua person, inherently modest, upon reading my first novel said, listen, I feel bad for us, but the person I feel worse for is you because it's so exposing. I didn't feel that way at all. I felt I had turned my story into art and I felt very dissociated from it. So much so that when people subsequently come up to me and know things about me, either from that book, which is now 40 something years old, or from things I've written, I'm always shocked that they know anything about me because in my actual life, I'm very private and I hate being talked about and I hate gossip so it's kind of amusing that I put it out there and then I don't remember in the rare times when I peeked into my first novel I really can't believe I did it I don't feel that way about evening because I really know that I invented this story even though I took constantly and unconsciously aspects from all kinds of things that I had noticed in my life that I didn't remember that ended up in there. And I I do want to give an example. I have a very beloved friend who made Aliyah from California, whom I met at Brandeis Camp Institute when I was 19, Linda, who died in her 30s of breast cancer in Israel. And this novel, in this novel, Tam, the elder sister in her 30s, dies of breast cancer. And I try very hard. I've unfortunately and heartbreakingly lost several very close women friends. And I try very hard year after year to phone their husbands, their siblings, whomever I'm still in touch with, just to remember them, especially as the years go by. So Linda has a wonderful sister who uh, has stayed very, very close to Linda's three daughters as they are now grown up and have children of their own, was always flying over to Israel, wonderful aunt. And we catch up only once a year. So she said to me, well, what are you working on? I said, I finally finished this novel. It's about, and then I thought, oh my God, she's the the second sister of three sisters and her elder sister died of breast cancer in her thirties, just like Eve. And I could never, I never had that thought. In the 30 years I was working on this book, I never thought about Linda directly, even though she is the first three poems in my grief book, very deliberately. So without being disingenuous, I would say Evening is a more autobiographical book because it comes from far deeper places in me, but it's not confessional in that way. And I would like to hope I haven't hurt people. I know writers who truly don't care. I'm not one of those people. I know that one of my impediments right now is that there's something I want to write about, not a story, but an aspect of life that I'm inhibited about writing about because I think I feel guilty. So I'm struggling with that because it's kind of the only thing that interests me. Um, That's the best I can do, Ricky. (laughs) I certainly think when you send me essays about the family, I devour them. 
I'm glad you're writing about the family too. <laughs> Could I ask a question? Okay. Sandra. Oh, yes. 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 Caution. yes. Could I? That, that before this, that actually I have I have to get to another meeting. So I think for me, this has to be the last question. But mom, if you want to stay on, go for it. Stay on a little bit longer. Okay, I have a so question. Anyone wants a question for Maddie, now's your chance. Okay, I want to ask you both a question. But first of all, I have a comment. The whole focus is on the American diaspora. But the British diaspora and the European diaspora have similar issues, which people don't seem to worry about as much as America. Okay, my question is, I worked in publishing before my Aliyah, and we were always told to take seriously work that comes in from an agent. And all the unsolicited manuscripts were read by a very junior editor, which was me. And uh, therefore, I ask you, because I have tried using agents, and I have published in spite of agents. I haven't had any encouragement from agents, and I've managed to publish. So do you use agents? Maddie, you're the one with the time-bound mitzvah, so you go first. Um, I have an agent. Wonderful. Um, and I would say my only, I wrote for magazines before having an agent for selling the book. I can't imagine having, I can't imagine going through that process without my agent, but that's very much has to do with my personality, which really required someone to see me through what was a very stressful process. Um, and also I think a bit, the book that I was writing, um, which is a, is a nonfiction book that's really research-based and that I felt like it, I benefited a lot from having an agent who could kind of explain and situate it a bit sort of in the marketplace. I know that there are writers who don't work with agents, um, especially for journalism or for, you know, shorter form writing on the internet or in magazines. Uh, and I think that's great. I didn't have one for a while and I thought that that was totally fine. Um, when your agent is someone that you are connected to and who you feel really understands what you're trying to do, I would say I think the biggest benefit is just having an advocate for your work who really appreciates what your goals are. Um, but again, I think that that comes down to very much the kind of support that I feel I need more than anything else. I do love my agent and I'm a little afraid of her, which I think is a great combination. Um, if you have to go, um, Marty, I do have a question I want to ask um, connected to mother daughter relationships. When, when we started this evening, your mother started to read from her book evening and then censored herself. Um, she stopped at a per certain point and confessed that the rest is a little bit too um, sexually risque, risque, risque. Risque. Okay. So are you embarrassed? This is a question between generations. Uh, you know, are you oh. embarrassed by your mother's sexuality? Um, is your all. mother embarrassed by your sexuality? Do you talk sex between you? Not on my account whatsoever she she sends herself for her own for her I think that that's probably not the first time you've done that mom whether I've been there or not no I feel she and I aren't as my mother always likes to say she and I are not peers so we're not the same and I'm sure she there are things that she doesn't tell me and things that I don't tell her but she and I are friends and as well as uh I think I I think that's safe to say mom as well as um, you know, a mother daughter pair. And I'm never embarrassed by, I'm lucky to have two parents who are artists, one writer, one painter. And I'm never embarrassed. The things that embarrass me that they do are when they go on and on about how great I am in public settings and I feel mortified. Um, or, not or, when, or, when we, <laughs> or when we dance at a wedding. <laughs> dance horribly in, in, uh, in full view of other people, not their beautiful, stunning, uh, incredible work. No, but they know how to embarrass me and it's really easy, uh, but it has nothing to do with their reading passages from their books or showing um, suggestive paintings. And I do want to say Maddie knows how to embarrass me too. In that sense, it's reciprocal, uh, but we, I think we try to be thoughtful. Uh, I'm, I think Maddie has a very sophisticated sensibility and she always had, even as a child. So. I don't, I, I don't think that Maddie's the kind of person because she loves art, both writing and visual art. She would never be a literal person who would say, ooh, that or that. I think Maddie, you always seem to understand what the sources of art are. And I feel 
I feel the same. Uh, I, I, I want to say one last thing before you go, Maddie, which Maddie knows, which is I, I'm not on social media at all, but I've taken to maybe every two weeks Googling Maddie's Twitter because people keep coming up to me and saying, oh, I saw you said this. I saw you said that. And the truth is things I say to Maddie on the phone turn up in her tweets and it serves me right. I embarrassed my parents by not asking them what I felt like quoting and I'm not embarrassed, but I'm astonished to find myself on Twitter and I deserve it. And that's the last thing I have to say in this context, Maddie Khan. <laughs> well, thank you so much all for having me and mom, I know you'll stick around. Uh, I wish I could, but I'm on truly the worst slate of deadlines I've been on probably in five years. So I have to get, uh, go to do another interview for a story. Um, but this was a pleasure. It was so too. wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the rest of you read those articles she writes that she says are not about Judaism, but about her family crest, about all these things that are really basically about a, a Judaism as far as I can see. <laughs> Maybe because I was looking for it. Thanks so Great. much, Maddie. Thank you. Thank you, Bye, Maddie. Maddie. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Nessa, I, I can I ask one? Karen, now you have no defenses, Nessa. Yeah, that's okay. I have I have about five minutes myself, so I'm really happy if anybody else has something pressing. Uh, it doesn't have to be the last time in the galaxy. Yeah, that I, I, I would you. like to ask a question, if possible. You mentioned before integrating Hebrew into your writing, um, and I was wondering how you do that and um, still keep in mind the, the non-Jewish, non-Israeli reader who, and maintain his understanding. I mean, have him understand what you're saying. How do you bridge that? And do you write in Hebrew letters or? No, 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 no. What I, I would say that, again, remember, I'm not hugely prolific. There was a time when I was writing a lot more short pieces. I focused not exclusively, but a lot on this novel, allowing for the fact that I have so many other lives that still need to keep going while I'm writing. Um, I would say in the earlier part of my writing, as in my first novel, there was literally Hebrew in English font, which you would understand by context. Frequently, there are Hebrew expressions that I might put into italics or translate even without um, alluding to their source. I have a novel that's one of the favorite things I ever read, uh, wrote that I worked on for 10 years that has not been published except in a small part in an in a anthology called Reading Ruth, Women Reading the Book of Ruth, in which I took five sources from the Hebrew Bible uh, narratives organized them in the way that corresponded to what I wanted to tell and told a, an allegorical story with some reality in it against those sources. Almost every sentence in the book in English alludes directly to a source in the Hebrew undertext, but I never tell the reader what the Hebrew undertext is. And one of the reasons that I didn't try hard to sell it, but one of the reasons that I quailed about selling it is because at least then I finished that in about... 1990, uh, no one in publishing really knew the Hebrew Bible anymore. It used to be the basis of English literature, but it wasn't. So of the few editors who saw it, um, they didn't really understand what I was doing. And I thought it was so intrepid. I was in love with this project. I spent a lot of time in the library. I read each source for a year. I really was interested in drawing on the sources of Jewish literature in my writing. I wanted to do, not to compare myself to James Joyce, but what James Joyce could do for Greek and Latin and especially Irish literature, I wanted to do for Jewish writing in English. And I was less interested in telling, I was somewhat interested in telling a Jewish story that had never been told. And my first novel was a pioneering novel in talking about a young woman's quest for God and spirituality and love. Uh, and that story hadn't been told because I was of the first generation who could have lived that story. But I was even more interested in the structures and myths and narratives and Talmudic discourse and questions, all of which not to translate it and not to tell Midrashic tales, but to tell a very contemporary story of people just like us mm -hmm. that drew on so much of that 
hidden wealth because I feel as if our body of work is as important, magisterial, and formative as the literature of anyone, and in some ways as people who gave birth to both Christianity and Islam, even more formative. So that's the way in which it shows. In a woman's book of grieving, sometimes I'll run into something. So for example, I talk about, there's it's very short prose poems. One of them is called On Suffering, and I say a woman who suffers, I'm paraphrasing, I can't quote it exactly, has thrust her fingers into the crevices of something. And it was only later that I saw that that was really an illusion, which I hadn't consciously been aware of, of those um, I forget what they're called um, in Yiddish, the, the, the notes you slip into the crevices of the Kotel. I wasn't talking about the Kotel at all, but it was a, an issue of- It's called the Kvittel. Kvittel, oh, yeah. Kvittel. Hope and writing, and that's where that illusion came from. So I, I think I'm so immersed, I'm so in love with our story that it's inevitable that it's gonna come out. Can I ask one more Thank question? You. Nessa, I, you, you, are, you have a romance with words and I love listening to you. And, but I wonder, is, do you find a generational difference between you and Mati in the words you use uh, in the vocabulary? Uh, because I sense it and, and living in Israel where we're cut off we, we, we don't uh, experience directly the changes. I haven't used the word trope or meme or woke and anything, and I've never grown a company. And I, I'm so sensitive to the fact that English is, ch is changing and I'm uh, not aware of all the changes. I, I can't answer that. I, I think all three of my children have excellent vocabularies because they grew up uh, swimming in the language of their mother and their father. <laughs> and because Toby's parents were both born in Germany, I think their English and, and his mother actually spent years in England as a refugee before she came here. And actually his father also studied for a year at Gateshead in England. Their language was inflected in many rich ways that I hear in Toby's language, even though he's not conscious of it. But I wanna say that the layers of Hebrew fascinate me, even though I'm not adept enough to be able to parse them. So for example, I was very intrigued by a project. I worked uh, fairly recently at a foundation that funded uh, projects in Israel. And one of them was a project that's online called Todot Israel that was wanted to record Dor Tashach, not only people who fought, but people who lived through the siege of Jerusalem and many kinds of people in their narratives before they left the world. And a couple of the people that were filmed were these very older, like 95-year-old kibbutznikim who were still on kibbutz, looking, having those beautiful, worn faces and those bodies that used to be working. Um, and they said things like, um, et medina. Well, I was enchanted by that. I just love that because my Hebrew that I learned was uh, we did Ivrit be Ivrit, but it was very rooted in, first of all, a different Hebrew. It was the Hebrew of the 50s, much closer to the biblical roots of Hebrew and to Agnon and to that kind of Yalek and the writers that we were reading and the Haskalah of the teachers, those very few teachers who would teach in a Jewish day school in the 50s. So I'm very aware of the change in Hebrew, which is very, very rapid. And I accept that change happens all the time, but I do feel very grateful for the Hebrew I was given because the kind of Hebrew that I love is still in a shuttling relationship with the Makarot in some way. And I notice it in Israel and I love it. Definitely, it's, a, it's part of what we used to say, Ani Chafetza, Ani Chafetza. And no one would say that now. I, it's, uh, you know, let's say, uh, there's so many things that we've changed. Uh, apparently my, my, grand, my husband's grandfather was a friend of Ben Yehuda and made up some of the words like kvish and, and, and all kinds of words connected to, uh, uh, you know, the construction at the time. Well, you see uh, that to me, that is aristocracy to me. That is my my definition of, of 
of aristocracy to have participated in the revived, in the only successfully revived spoken language in the history of the world. That is really a Yerusha. I want to end with one comment. Um, I'm going to have to go myself. Um, I think a big difference between the Nessa of my youth and the Nessa today is that I have a greater acceptance of the fact that I may never have the audience I hope to have. I may never be read by the numbers I hope to be read. I have a huge immutable mechitza now between the marketplace and the quality of my work. And I never mix them up, which when I was young, I couldn't do that. So I have great sympathy. I live in New York. It's the center of publishing. I worked in publishing. So even though it's long, long, long ago, I still have connections and I've had several agents. And I recognize that that's very much conditioned by my profession and Maddie as well, being in media. It's not a, it's not a level playing field here. Right. Right. Um, but I also know I've been forced to know that whatever happens out there, I have this quiet confidence that what I'm meant to do and what I'm meant to write and what my passion is and what I feel all my ancestors made their sacrifices so that I could be this kind of Jewish writer, that's what I have. And that's what I've got to do. And it's very, very different. I think the opportunity now to find a place for your work online, even if you're not famous, and even if it has fewer readers, it's not really possible never to get your words out if you really keep writing and you really keep submitting to small magazines and other platforms uh, and the tiniest venues. I do believe that people who don't quit and who are have something to say will find a way to say it. It's not nearly the same as being popular, selling, let alone making money on your work, which I assure you will never happen to me. But I feel there's something I'm called upon to do. I don't feel other people are doing it. I feel really blessed and lucky. Uh, what amazing advice you have just given us. Because uh, yeah. I'm sure this is something that all of us wanted to talk about as well among all the other things, all the other subjects that really uh, yeah. uh, spoke to us all evening and really- Although Karen, if I hadn't succeeded in selling this novel, I wouldn't probably sound like this because my last book <laughs> came out when I was in my early forties and I knew it would have been very, very, I was prepared to publish it myself. That's how serious I was. Unlike the allegorical novel, I would have done anything it took just to make sure that when I leave this world, evening is between covers, even if it's online covers. So I have that side of me too. It's a, it's, it's a very poetic and beautiful book and I recommend it to everyone here. Uh, we're not enough to make you a bestseller, but I'm sure we're- Wow, I'll take every reader, please. If you liked this hour plus, Please buy evening and give it to someone who you think will like it as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you very and much. Thank and my family. Uh, thank you. Thank and you, all Nessa. the audience and Michael and everybody who made this happen. It's such a pleasure to talk across the Atlantic, and I would love to come back. Come You're always come. welcome to come home. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's how I thank see you. it. Too. Bye bye. Thank you. Come see you. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who don't have to leave right now, I just want to tell you that on uh, March 6th, uh, February 16th, we're speaking with Alicia Ostreicher. Uh, if you're interested on February 7th, I'm ha my Yiddish book is being launched at Ben Gurion University. And we have another, we have a, another evening on cooking very soon. Uh, poems and, and, and writing about cooking um, so that, uh, you know, it's, it'd be wonderful to see you all in, in our next events, uh, especially the interview with uh, Alicia Ostreicher. Have I forgotten something, Michael? Thank Michael you, Karen. Mentioned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night. It's been stay well, stay healthy, stay, well. stay warm. Stay happy, stay creative. All these impossible goals. Keep, yeah. keep writing. <laughs>
keep writing yeah. and we'll see you next time yeah. good night it's been a great evening thank you everybody